Chapter 1 of Friendly Fairies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bridget Herbis. Friendly Fairies by Johnny Gruel. Chapter 1. The Three Little Gnomes. A silvery thread of smoke curled up over the trunk of the old tree and floated away through the forest, and teeny voices came from beneath the trunk of the old tree. Long, long ago, the tree had stood strong and upright, and its top branches reached far above any of the other trees in the forest. But the tree had grown so old it began to shiver when the storms howled through the branches. And as each storm came, the old tree shook more and more, until finally, in one of the fiercest storms, it tumbled to the earth with a great crash. There it lay for centuries, and vines and bushes grew about in a tangled mass until it was almost hidden from view. Now down beneath the trunk of the fallen tree lived three little gnomes, and it was the smoke from their fire which curled up over the trunk of the old tree and floated away through the forest. They were preparing dinner and laughing and talking together when they heard the sound of a horn. What can it be? one asked. It sounds like the horn of a huntsman, another cried. As the sound came nearer, the three little gnomes stamped upon their fire and put it out so that no one would discover their home. Then they climbed upon the trunk of the old tree and ran along it to where they could see across an open space in the forest without being seen themselves. And when the sound of the horn drew very close, they saw a little boy climb through the thick bushes. As the little boy came out into the open space, the three little gnomes saw that he was crying. He must be lost, said the first little gnome. He looks very tired and hungry, said the second little gnome. Let us go and ask him, said the third little gnome. So the three little gnomes scrambled down from the trunk of the fallen tree and went up to where the little boy had thrown himself upon the ground. They stood about him and watched him, for he had put his face in the crook of his arm and was crying. Finally, one of the little gnomes sat down in front of the little boy and spoke to him. I am lost, the little boy said. My father went hunting yesterday with all his men, and when they were out of sight, I took my little horn and followed them. But I soon lost their track, and I have wandered about with nothing to eat. Last night, I climbed into a tree and slept. The three little gnomes wiped the little boy's eyes and led him to their home under the fallen tree. There they finished preparing the dinner and sat about until the little boy had eaten and had fallen asleep. Then the three little gnomes carried him into their house, away back in the trunk of the tree, and placed him upon one of their little beds. When the three little gnomes had finished their dinner, they lit their pipes and wondered how they might help the little boy find his way home. Let us go to the old Wizzy Owl and see if he can suggest anything, said one. Yes, brothers, cried another. Let us go to old Wizzy Owl. So the three little gnomes went to the home of Wizzy Owl, and Wizzy Owl said he would fly high above the forest and try and see the little boy's home. I cannot see his home, cried Wizzy Owl. Maybe Fuzzy Fox can tell you. So the three little gnomes went to the home of Fuzzy Fox, and Fuzzy Fox said he would run through the forest and see if he could find the little boy's home. So Fuzzy Fox ran through the forest, but he could not find the little boy's home. But, said Fuzzy Fox, I came upon a wounded deer who told me that a party of huntsmen had passed through the forest yesterday and had shot her with an arrow. So the three little gnomes went to see the wounded deer, and they washed the wound the arrow had made and bound it up for her. Then the three little gnomes sat upon Fuzzy Fox's back, and he ran on through the forest with them until they came to a wild boar. The wild boar had been crippled by the huntsmen, he told the three little gnomes, but had managed to hide himself in the thick bushes and escape. It must have been the little boy's father and his men, said the wild boar. I am so sorry that I am wounded, for I would like to help him. Then the fuzzy fox ran with the three little gnomes through the forest, and they met a wounded bear, and a wounded squirrel, and five or six wounded bunny rabbits. And they all told the three little gnomes that the huntsmen had shot them with arrows, and that they had just managed to escape. The three little gnomes felt very sorry for their wounded friends, and helped them all they could by washing their wounds and tying them up. 
We are sorry that we cannot go with you and help find the little boy's home, they all said, for his mother will miss him and cry for him. And we know how much a mama or a daddy can miss a little boy or girl, for we have all grieved for our own little ones that the huntsmen who roam this forest have killed. That is why we feel sorry that we cannot help you bring him back to his mother. So Fuzzy Fox ran until he came to the edge of the forest, and then the three little gnomes saw a large castle away in the distance, with bright red roofs on the tall towers. That must be the little boy's home, said one little gnome. Let us return at once to our home under the fallen tree, and ask the little boy, said another. So Fuzzy Fox ran with them back to their home, and the little boy told them it was his home. Then the kind Fuzzy Fox took the three little gnomes and the little boy upon his back and ran to the edge of the forest, and on the way they stopped to see the wounded animals, and they were all glad that the little boy's mama and daddy would soon see him. Oh, if we could only see the children who have been taken away from us by the huntsmen, they said as they bade the little boy goodbye. So Fuzzy Fox carried the three little gnomes and the little boy almost to the castle gate and shook hands with him. I will remember the way to your home, the little boy told the three little gnomes, and I will be back to see you soon. The next day, when the three little gnomes were preparing dinner, they again heard the little boy's horn and ran along the trunk of the tree until they came to where they could see across the open space. Soon there came a great many people, and riding upon a fine horse in front of his daddy was the little boy. But this day he wore fine silk and satin clothes, and they were not torn by the brambles and bushes. Near him rode a beautiful lady. She was the little boy's mama. So the three little gnomes went out to meet them, and the little boy slid from the horse and ran to them and threw his arms around them. This is my daddy, and this is my mama, he told them. The little boy's mama and the little boy's daddy dismounted and came to the three little gnomes and thanked them for returning the little boy to them. We will give you anything you wish for, said the little boy's mama and daddy. We wish for nothing, said the three little gnomes. We live happily here in the forest and our wants are simple. But if you can send us some clean white cloths to bind up the wounds you give our forest friends, we would be very grateful. I told daddy of the wounded creatures, said the little boy. Yes, his daddy said, and I have given orders that no one in my country shall hunt through this forest, and from now on your forest friends will be unmolested, and can always live here in peace and happiness. For the great king was sorry that he or his men had ever caused any of the forest creatures any sorrow. And after that, the creatures of the forest were never harmed, and they grew up so tame they would wander right up to the castle where the king's men would feed them. The teeny thread of smoke still curls up over the trunk of the fallen tree, and the voices of the little boy and his daddy mingle with the teeny voices of the three little gnomes as they prepare their dinner, for the great king and the little prince come often to visit their friends, the three little gnomes. End of chapter 1「ジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケンジャンケン What are you making? asked Timothy Toad as he hopped through the grass and sat in front of Willie. Oh, I'm just whittling because I have nothing else to do, replied Willie Woodchuck. So Timothy Toad hopped on down the path until he met Eddie Elf. Willie Woodchuck is whittling because he has nothing else to do, said Timothy Toad. I will stop by and see him, said Eddie Elf. So Timothy Toad hopped along the path until he met Gertie Gartersnake. Willie Woodchuck is whittling because he has nothing better to do, said Timothy Toad. I will go down that way and see him, said Gertie Gartersnake, and she started down the path. 
So Timothy Toad hopped down the path until he met Wally Woodpecker. Willie Woodchuck is whittling because he has nothing better to do, said Timothy Toad. I will fly down and see him, said Wally Woodpecker. And away he flew. Timothy Toad hopped on down the road until he met Billy Bumblebee. Willie Woodchuck is whittling because he has nothing else to do, said Timothy Toad. I will buzz down that way and see him, said Billy Bumblebee as he buzzed away. When Timothy Toad arrived at his home, his wife, Tilly Toad, was sweeping off the front steps. What do you think, Tilly? Timothy Toad cried. Willie Woodchuck is whittling because he has nothing else to do. Dear me! You don't say, cried Tilly Toad, as she stood her broom in the corner and started down the path. I will hop down and see him, she said. I will hop back with you, Tilly, said Timothy Toad. They had not hopped far before they met Eddie Elf, who was singing happily to himself as he walked along. Willie Woodchuck is whittling on a rattle, he said, when the two toads stopped him. We are hopping back to see him, said Tilly and Timothy Toad. I will go back with you, said Eddie Elf. They had not gone far until they met Gertie Gartersnake singing away very happily. Willie Woodchuck is whittling on a beautiful red and black rattle, said Gertie Gartersnake. We are going back to see him, said Tilly and Timothy Toad and Eddie Elf. Then I will go back with you, said Gertie Gartersnake. They had not gone far until they met Wally Woodpecker, who was also singing happily. Willie Woodchuck is whittling on a rattle, and it is blue, red, and black, and rattles beautifully. We are going back to see him, said Tilly and Timothy Toad, and Eddie Elf, and Gertie Garter Snake. Then I will go back with you, said Wally Woodpecker. They had not gone far before they had met Billy Bumblebee. Willie Woodchuck is whittling on a beautiful yellow and blue and red and black rattle, and it rattles beautifully. We are going back to see him, said Tilly and Timothy Toad, and Eddie Elf, and Wally Woodpecker. Then I will go back with you, said Billy Bumblebee. So away they all went until they came to Willie Woodchuck's home. Where is Willie Woodchuck, they asked, of Winnie Woodchuck, his wife. He has taken his beautiful new yellow and red and blue and black and white rattle, which rattles so beautifully, over to show Grumpy Grundy the Owl, said Winnie Woodchuck. Then we will go there, said the others. Then I will go with you, said Winnie Woodchuck. Grumpy Grundy the Owl was a very cross old creature, and if everything did not suit her all the time, she hooted and howled. In fact, she cried so much she had made large red rings around her eyes. When Tilly and Timothy Toad and Eddie Elf and Gertie Gartersnake and Wally Woodpecker and Billy Bumblebee and Winnie Woodchuck arrived at Grumpy Grundy's place, they heard merry laughter, and whenever the laughter ceased, they heard the buzz and the rattle and the hum of Willie Woodchuck's rattle. So they went inside, and there was Willie Woodchuck with a beautiful yellow and red and blue and black and white rattle, and when he rattled it, Grumpy Grundy rolled on the floor and laughed until the tears ran from her eyes. So they all lifted Grumpy Grundy on a chair and wiped her eyes, and what do you think? The red rings around them were wiped away, and she looked young and pretty again. Oh dear, said Grumpy Grundy the owl, I have never enjoyed myself so much before, and I will never be grumpy and be called a Grundy again. No, sir, never and her eyes twinkled with merriment. 
and all were greatly pleased at the great change in Grumpy Grundy. Eddie Elf laughed, and Tilly and Timothy Toad chuckled. Gertie Gardersnake giggled. Wally Woodpecker beat a tattoo on wood. Billy Bumblebee buzzed, and Winnie Woodchuck sang a woodchuck song. And after that, no one could say that Willie Woodchuck had nothing else to do, for he spent his time making beautiful happy rattles, which he gave away to all the creatures, and everyone laughed and made merry whenever they heard the beautiful yellow and red and blue and black and white rattles, which rattled so beautifully and drove away the grumpies. End of chapter 2 Recording by Larry, Johnson City, Tennessee Chapter 3 of Friendly Fairies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jackie Castle. Friendly Fairies by Johnny Gruel. Chapter 3. Recipe for a Happy Day. One morning, Marjorie's mama called to her several times before Marjorie answered, for her pretty brown eyes were very sleepy and would hardly stay open. Come, dear, please hurry, for I want you to run to the grocery before breakfast, Mama called from the foot of the stairs. Oh, dear, exclaimed Marjorie, I don't want to get up. And keeping her head on the pillow just as long as she could, Marjorie crawled out of bed backwards. Her clothes were scattered about the room and her stockings were turned inside out. Her dress would not fasten and she cried so that Mama had to come upstairs and dress her. Now you see, Marjorie's day began all wrong. For everything started topsy-turvy. Now hurry, dear, Mama said, as she handed Marjorie the basket. Marjorie slammed the door as she went out, and she was so cross she did not notice the beautiful sunshine, nor hear the pretty songs which greeted her from the treetops. It's so far to the old store, Marjorie grumbled to herself as she pouted her pretty lips and shuffled her feet along the path. Hello, Marjorie, laughed a merry voice. Marjorie saw a queer little elf sitting upon a stone at the side of the road. His little green suit was so near the color of the leaves, Marjorie could scarcely distinguish him from the foliage. He wore a funny little pointed cap of a brilliant red, and sticking in it was a long yellow feather. Two long hairs grew from his eyebrows and curled over his cap. He was hardly as large as Marjorie's doll Jane. "'Who are you, and where did you come from?' Marjorie cried, for she thought him the most comical little creature she had ever seen. "'Why, I'm Mary Chuckle from Make-Believe Land,' replied the elf. "'And aren't you very cross this lovely day?' "'I did not want to get up,' cried Marjorie, "'and I just hate to go to the store. It's too far.' She dropped her basket on the ground and sat down beside the elf on the large stone. "'Isn't it funny?' laughed Mary Chuckle. There are hundreds of children just like you who make hard work of getting up when they are called in the morning and who remain cross and ugly all day long. I really do not mean to be cross, but I just can't help it sometimes, Marjorie said. Oh, but indeed you can help it, Marjorie, the elf solemnly said as he shook his tiny finger at her nose. And I am going to tell you how. First of all, when you awaken in the morning, you must say to yourself, Oh, what a lovely, happy day this is going to be. Then, raise your arms above your head and take three long, deep breaths. Jump out of bed quickly, always remembering to put your toes on the floor first. For, continued Mary Chuckle, old witchy crosspatch is always waiting for children to get out of bed backwards. And when they do, she catches them by the heels and turns everything topsy-turvy all day long. But... When you get out of bed toes first, I'll be there to start you on a pleasant day, and Witchy Crosspatch will have to return to make-believe land and hide her head. Sure enough, I did crawl out of bed backwards this morning, Marjorie said. I know you did, my dear, Mary Chuckle giggled. And every time you do, old Witchy Crosspatch makes everything seem disagreeable. But I hate to run errands, Mr. Chuckle cried Marjorie. The old road is so dreadfully long and tiresome. But the longer the road, the more happiness you can find along the way, my dear. Mary Chuckle replied, quick as a wink, his little eyes twinkling brightly. If you look up at the blue sky and the beautiful sunshine and sing with the birds as you run along, you'll find the road seems too short, and you'll be back before you notice it. Just try and see. 
So Marjorie looked up the road with a smile, and sure enough, it did not seem far to the store. And when she turned around, she was sitting upon the stone alone. The little elf had suddenly disappeared. Marjorie picked up her basket and skipped down the road, singing at the top of her voice. And before she had time to think about how far it was, she was back home, telling Mama all about the queer little elf from make-believe land. You haven't been away long enough to stop and talk with anyone on the road, laughed Mama. Are you sure you have not been dreaming? Marjorie wondered if it really had only been a dream. But the next morning, when the golden sunshine peeped through her bedroom curtains, Marjorie did as Mary Chuckle had told her the day before. First of all, she woke up and cried, Oh, what a lovely day this is going to be! Then she took three long, deep breaths. And then she jumped out of bed quickly, right on her toes. And sure enough, old witchy Crossbatch had to go back to make-believe land and hide her head. So Marjorie spent a lovely, happy day with Mary Chuckle. I hope all children will hear of my recipe for a joyous day, said Mary Chuckle, so that each day for them can be filled with sunshine and happiness. End of chapter 3 Recording by Jackie Castle Chapter 4 of Friendly Fairies This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry, Johnson City, Tennessee. Friendly Fairies by Johnny Gruel. Chapter 4 Grandfather Skeeterhawk's Story It was a beautiful day in late summer. Tommy Grasshopper, Johnny Cricket, Willie Ladybug were playing on a high bank of the river and watching the little fish jumping after tiny flies and bugs that fell upon the surface of the stream. Let's go higher so that we can see them better, Willie Ladybug said. Yes, let's climb up the tall reed so that we can look right down in the water, Johnny Cricket said. But we must be very careful not to fall for the fish would soon swallow us. And that would not be very much fun, he laughed. So Tommy Grasshopper and Johnny Cricket caught hold of Willie Ladybug's four little hands and helped him to climb up the tall reeds, for Willie was not as old as the other bug boys and might fall in the water if they did not help him. From the tall reeds, the three bug boys could look down in the water and see the pretty little sunfish and the long, slim pickerel darting around and turning their sunny sides so that the sun would reflect its rays on them, just as if they were looking glasses. The bug boys watched the fish until they grew tired, and they were just starting down the tall reed when the great big dragonfly flew upon the top of the reed and called to them. Of course all the bug boys knew old Grandpa Skeeter Hawk, for it was he. So the three returned to the reed and sat down again to pass the time of day with Grandpa. Presently, Willie Ladybug saw a strange fish in the water. What kind of fish is that? Grandpa Skeeter Hawk, he asked. That's a catfish, Grandpa replied. Queer-looking fish, the catfish are. They do most of their feeding at night since Omosco, the elk, flattened their heads. Dear me, are their heads flat? Johnny Cricket asked. Flat as a pancake, Grandpa Skeeter replied, and then told them this story. I've heard Grandpa tell that once the catfish had heads that were shaped like sunfish. Grandpa Skeeterhawk said, and they thought that they were not the only most beautiful fish, but the most fiercest fish in the world, although they would always swim away as fast as they could whenever anything came near them. You see, they really were not even a teeny weeny bit brave, but when the catfish got by themselves and they thought, there was no one else to overhear them, 
they would make up fairy tales of wonderful adventures they had gone through and fierce monsters they had destroyed one would say i wish i were large enough to drag home an enormous giant eel i killed today he was sixteen feet long and weighed five hundred pounds another would say pooh that's nothing why you ought to see an indian who tried to catch me in a net why i not only pulled him in the water i dragged him all over the bottom but i made him promise he would never disturb any of the catfish tribe after this just then a little bird flew over the water and his shadow so startled the boastful catfish they buried themselves in the mud at the bottom of the stream after a while grandpa skeeterhawk continued they got up courage to peek out of the mud and as they saw nothing to frighten them they formed a circle and told more tales of their frightening qualities one old catfish who had been the leader because he could tell the biggest tales and hide under the mud quicker than any of the others finally said we are the best fish in the water as you all know so i think it would be a good plan to fight everything that comes near the water from the land shall we fight the big hawk who wades in the water and catches some of us ask a little kitten fish kitten fish should be seen and not heard the old chief catfish answered quickly i do not believe we should harm the hawk he's not large enough i was thinking of the large beast who comes wading along the shores and eats the grasses that grows beneath the surface you know he has to raise his head every once in a while in order to breathe so if we should all hang on to him we could pull him under the water so the catfish although they were so frightened that their fins grew stiff decided they would follow their chief for they expected he would be the first to hide under the mud when the big beast came finally old amasco the elk came down to the river to feed and the old chief catfish swam out and pulled on omasco's whiskers and all the other catfish cried see how brave and fearless the mighty catfish are and they all swam out and pulled omasco's whiskers too this made omasco very angry for he never harmed any fish in his life he began jumping and pawing with his heavy hoofs and smashed all the catfish down in the mud and when they finally came out again which was not until two or three days later their heads were as flat as they are now that is why all catfish have flat heads grandpa skeeterhawk finished it served them right for being so boastful johnny cricket said it served them right for trying to harm someone who never harmed them grandpa skeeter replied as he darted up in the air and flew over the tall cattails end of chapter four recording by larry johnson city tennessee chapter five of friendly fairies this is a lever box recording all lever box recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit leverbox.org recording by larry johnson city tennessee friendly fairies by johnny gruel chapter five crow talk caw, caw, caw. one old crow cried as he faced the other two crows caw? asked the second old crow as he plumbed his feathers and screwed his head around to get a better view of the little boy lying under the tree caw, 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 replied the first crow those crows must be talking to each other dicky dorn thought to himself as he lay upon his back under the big oak tree and watched the three crows the third crow now cried ah, caw, caw. 
Dicky jumped up and ran down the hill to where Granny lived. It was a tiny little house, not much larger than a piano box, but it was plenty large enough for Granny, for Granny was only two feet high. Some people even thought Granny was a witch. Of course, Dicky knew that Granny was not a witch, for Granny was very good and kind. So Dicky knocked on Granny's tiny front door. Come in, Granny cried. Good morning, Dicky, she said, as Dicky crawled into the tiny living room. When Dicky took a seat upon the tiny sofa, he did not know just how to ask Granny for what he wanted, so he twiddled his thumbs. Why do you twiddle your thumbs, Dicky? Granny asked as she smiled through her glasses at him. I was wondering what the three crows were talking of, Dicky replied. Granny went to her tiny cupboard and brought out a little bottle of purple fluid. She dropped three drops of this into a tiny spoon and held it to Dicky. Am I to take it, Granny? Yes, my dear, and you will be able to understand what the three crows are talking about. Dicky swallowed the purple fluid, for he was very anxious to return to the big oak tree and listen to the crows. Granny watched him for a few moments with her eyes full of twinkles, and then she told him to run along to the tree. And Dickie thanked Granny and ran as fast as he could to the tree where the three crows were still talking. The first crow cried, I know where there is a box filled with golden pennies. Ah, my brother, where? asked the second crow. In the middle of the great meadow, and it will belong to the first one who finds it. I know where there is a box full of candy, the third crow cried. Ah, where is it, my brother? asked the first crow. In the middle of the great meadow, and it will belong to the first one who finds it. I know where there is a full box of ice cream, cried the second crow. Ah, my brother, where? asked the third crow. In the middle of the great meadow, and it will belong to the one who finds it first. Then the crows went on talking about other things, but Dickie did not hear them, for he was running in the direction of the great meadow as fast as he could. And when he came to the middle of the great meadow, there was a large box. And in the large box, there were three other boxes. One contained golden pennies, another the candy, and the third was full of ice cream. I found it first, Dicky cried, and he took a pencil stub from his pocket, and with much twisting of mouth and thinking, he printed his name upon the box. Then Dicky ran home as fast as he could and told Daddy Dorn. Daddy Dorn hitched up Dobbin Dorn, and Dicky and Daddy went to the middle of the great meadow and put the big box in the wagon and took it home. Then they called Mama Dorn, and they all ate some of the ice cream and candy. Then Dicky took some of the ice cream and candy and some of the golden pennies to Granny. Then Dickie ran back home and had some more ice cream and candy, and asked Daddy if he might take some of the golden pennies downtown and buy something. And Daddy Dorn said, Of course, Dickie Dorn, for they are your golden pennies. So Dickie Dorn took two handfuls of golden pennies downtown and bought a fine little pony with a little round stomach, and he bought a pretty pony cart and harness. Then Dicky drove the pony back home. By the time Dicky reached home, he was hungry for more ice cream and candy, so he went to the box to get some. Oh, Mama and Daddy, he cried, come see. The box is full of candy and ice cream. And sure enough, that was the case, for although they had eaten almost all of the ice cream and candy before, now the two boxes were filled again. 
Then Daddy Dorn took two large handfuls of golden pennies from the golden penny box. They watched the box fill up with pennies again. Wee! cried Dicky Dorn. Wee! cried Mama Dorn. And wee! cried Daddy Dorn. We will give a party. So Dicky Dorn drove around to everyone's house in his pony cart and invited everyone to come to the party. And they all had such a nice time. They ate the ice cream box empty 16 times and filled it right up again. And they ate the candy box empty 17 times and it filled right up again. And Dicky and Mama and Daddy Dorn gave everyone all the golden pennies they could carry home and emptied the penny box 18 times. And whenever they emptied the golden penny box, it filled right up again. And everyone felt very grateful to Dickie Dorn and thanked him for such a nice time. And Dickie brought Granny out of a corner where she was eating her eighth dish of ice cream and told everyone that it was Granny who had really given the party, and he told them how Granny had helped him to learn crow talk. So the people never called Granny a witch after that, for they knew she was very good and kindly. And Dickie put the three boxes, the candy box, the ice cream box, and the box with golden pennies, out in front of his house so that whenever anyone wished candy or ice cream or golden pennies, they might walk up and help themselves. Dickie Dorn calls it an all-the-time party, for there is always someone out in front of Dickie Dorn's house eating from the candy and the ice cream box and filling their pockets with golden pennies. Someday I hope to see you there. End of chapter 5 Recording by Larry, Johnson City, Tennessee Chapter 6 of Friendly Fairies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Friendly Fairies by Johnny Gruel. Chapter 6 The Fairy Ring. A little old man with a violin tucked under his arm shuffled down the attic steps and the many flights of stairs until finally he reached the streets. As he shuffled down the street, he clutched his coat tightly about his throat, for the air was chill and he felt cold. At the first street corner he stopped, and he placed his violin to his shoulder to play. But catching a glance from the policeman across the street, he hastily tucked his violin under his arm and shuffled on. He walked a great distance before he again stopped. It was a busy corner where hundreds of people passed every few minutes, but when he played, no one stopped to listen to his music much less to drop anything in the tiny tin cup he had placed on the sidewalk before him. Tears came to the poor little old man's eyes. Everyone was too busy to stop to hear his music. So in the evening, when he slowly retraced his steps towards his attic home, his feet were very tired, and he shuffled more than he had in the morning. His back humped, and his head drooped more, and the tears nearly blinded him. He had to stop and rest at each flight of stairs, and he fell to his knees just as he reached the attic door. He sat there and rested a while. Then he caught hold of the doorknob and raised himself to his feet. A quaint little white-haired woman greeted him with a cheery smile as he entered. Then, seeing his sad face, she turned her head and tears came to her eyes. Honey, the little old man sobbed, and he stumbled towards her chair and fell to his knees before her, burying his face in her lap. Neither could say a word for a long time. Then the little old man told her he had been unable to make a single penny by playing. No one cares to hear an old man play the violin, he said. No one cares that we go hungry and cold, and I can still play, he added fiercely, just as well as I ever could. Listen to this. And the little old man stood up and he drew his bow across the violin strings in a sure, fiery manner so that the lamp chimney rattled and sang with the vibrations of the strings. And in his fierceness he improvised a melody so wild and beautiful his sister sat entranced. As the little old man finished the melody he stood still more upright, then straightening his old shoulders and pulling his hat firmly on his head, he stooped and kissed the old lady and walked with a firm tread to the door. I shall make them take notice tonight, 
he cried. I shall return with success. So again he went down the long flight of stairs and down the street until he came to a good corner where traffic was heavy. There, with the mood upon him which had fired him in the attic, he played again the wild melody. A few people hesitated as they passed, but no one stopped. This was an old woman, bent and wrinkled, who helped herself along with a cane. She stopped and looked him squarely in the eye, and the little old man felt he should recognize her, but he could not remember where he had seen her before, nor was he sure that he had ever looked upon her until now. At any rate, the faint memory inspired him, and raising his violin, he played a beautiful lullaby. Before he had finished, the old woman leaned over and dropped something into his little tin cup. It sounded as loud as a silver dollar would have sounded. The dear old generous soul, the man thought as he continued playing. He played for hours, but the old woman was the only one who stopped. I will at least have enough to get Cynthia some warm food, he said, thinking of what the old lady had dropped into his tin cup. But when he looked, what was his dismay to see only a large iron ring? Again he climbed the stairs to the attic, but he felt too weary to say a thing, and his sister knew that he had met with disappointment. He tossed the iron ring to her lap and went over to the bed and threw himself upon it. This is the end, he said, and told her about the iron ring. The old woman seemed interested in my playing, he said, and perhaps she gave all she could give. Let us not be downhearted, brother, said the sister. Surely tomorrow you will find someone who will reward your talent. The little old man was quiet for a long time, and then he arose and again drew his bow across the violin strings. The old lady sat very still and dreamed, for her brother was playing one of their childhood songs. As she lost herself in reverie, she turned the iron ring around her finger and saw upon its surface, as she turned it, the faces of her playmates of long ago. And as the brother swept from one melody to another, she saw the iron ring change color and grow larger and larger. And, as she turned it, she saw the figures of her childhood playmates turn before her upon her lap, and they joined their voices with the silvery notes of the violin's long-ago songs, until the attic was filled with the melody and the figures danced from her lap and, taking her by the hand, circled in the center of the room laughing and singing. The little old man had been playing with his eyes closed, but as the songs grew louder, he opened them and beheld the ring of little figures, with his sister holding hands with two of them. And rising from the bed, still playing the childhood songs of long ago, he walked to the center of the room. As he did so, the figures rose in the air and seemed to grow lighter and larger. And suddenly the scene changed. He was out in the woods, with lofty trees towering above him, while all about laughing and talking were hundreds of little fairies, gnomes, and sprites. And there, too, were the playmates of long ago, just as he had seen them when he closed his eyes and played in the attic. And there, too, was his sister, as she had been when a child. He looked at himself, and lo, he was no longer wrinkled and old. He was young again. In his gladness he danced with joy, and catching his sister to his breast, he kissed her again and again. And looking about him with shining eyes, he drew his bow across the strings and played a tune so lively and full of sweet happiness, the childhood friends caught hands and danced in a circle. And the little sprites, elves, gnomes, and fairies caught hands and danced around the children. And as they passed before the brother, he caught a mischievous glance from the eyes of one of the little fairies. And he knew in a moment she was the one who had played the old woman, and who had given him the iron ring. The people who lived in the room below the attic room missed the old man's shuffling step, and, not hearing it for two days, they told the landlady, a kindly soul who had let the brother and sister have the attic room free of charge, and all went up to investigate. They rapped upon the attic door. All was quiet within. Timidly, they opened the door and looked in. There upon the floor lay an old, rusty iron ring. It was the fairy ring. End of chapter 6 Recording by Jackie Castle Chapter 7 of Friendly Fairies This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Betty B. Friendly Fairies by Johnny Gruel Chapter 7 Mr. and Mrs. Thumbkins 
Thumbkins ran beneath the bushes and down the tiny path until he came to where Tommy Grasshopper sat upon a blade of grass swinging in the breeze. Have you seen Mrs. Thumbkins, Tommy Grasshopper? Thumbkins called. I have been asleep, replied Tommy Grasshopper, and I haven't seen her. Oh dear, oh dear, cried Thumbkins. She has not been home all day. Perhaps she went over to see Grandpa Tobacky Worm, suggested Tommy Grasshopper, as he flicked his wings and made the blade of grass swing up and down. So Thumbkins thanked Tommy Grasshopper and ran over to Grandpa Tobacky Worm's house. Grandpa Tobacky Worm was sitting upon a blade of grass, swinging in the breeze and smoking his old clay pipe. Oh, Grandpa Tobacky Worm, have you seen Mrs. Thumbkins? She has not been at home all day, and I cannot find her, cried Thumbkins. Yes, I saw her early this morning, going down the path with her acorn basket, said Grandpa Tobacky Worm, as he blew a few rings of smoke in the air. Perhaps she has gone to the Katie did grocery store to buy something, Grandpa Tobacky Worm added, as he bounced up and down on his blade of grass. So Thumbkins thanked Grandpa Tobacky Worm and went on down the tiny path. Hello, Thumbkins, cried a cheery voice as Thumbkins ran under a bunch of flowers. Where are you going in such a hurry? Thumbkins saw Billy Bumblebee sitting upon one of the flowers, swinging in the breeze. Mrs. Thumbkins has not been home all day, said Thumbkins, and I cannot find her anywhere. Hum, replied Billy Bumblebee. Let me think hum this was his way of thinking very hard perhaps she has gone over to see grandpa tobacky worm mr thumbkins no replied thumbkins i went there and also over to the katy did store but she was not there suppose you climb upon my back thumbkins and let me help you find her said billy bumblebee as he buzzed his wings making the flower sway up and down so thumbkins climbed up the flower stalk and took a seat upon Billy Bumblebee's back. Let us fly way up in the air so that we may look down over all the country, said Billy Bumblebee, as he made his wings whir and climbed high in the air. Billy Bumblebee and Thumbkins looked over the country carefully, but they could not see Mrs. Thumbkins anywhere. Finally, Billy's sharp eyes discovered something shiny down by the side of the pond, so they flew down towards it it was a new tin can house the door was closed thumbkins alighted from billy bumblebee's back and knocked at the door tinky tinky tink grump grump said a deep voice from inside the tin can house billy bumblebee peeped through a chink in a window and saw a hoppy toad with his mouth full of pancakes so thumbkins picked up a pebble and knocked louder tonky tonky tonk old man hoppy toad came to the door with a pancake in each hand and another large one in his mouth grump grump he said where is mrs thumbkins billy bumblebee demanded as he buzzed around old man hoppy toad's head i don't know said old man hoppy toad when he had swallowed the pancake yes you do thumbkins cried as he caught old man hoppy toad's hand who made those pancakes for you Billy Bumblebee buzzed closer to Old Man Hoppy Toad's head, and Old Man Hoppy Toad blinked his big round eyes and finally said, She is locked up in the kitchen. So Thumbkins ran to the kitchen and came out with Mrs. Thumbkins. Old Man Hoppy Toad had locked her in the kitchen so she would have to bake lots and lots of pancakes for him. Thumbkins was so glad to see Mrs. Thumbkins, he came very near crying and billy bumblebee said to old man hoppy toad now you must leave our neighborhood for we do not permit anyone to bother anyone else in the town of tiny things so old man hoppy toad had to pack up all his things in a red handkerchief and hustle out of town and billy bumblebee buzzed right around his head as old man hoppy toad went down the path lickety split hoppity hop and never once looked behind him thumbkins and mrs thumbkins went back home and when billy bumblebee returned and told them he had made old man hoppy toad go way down to the river they knew they would never be troubled with him again
Mrs. Thumpkins said she had fried pancakes all day, but she was not too tired to fry more, so she made a lot of pancakes while Billy Bumblebee flew home and returned with a bucket of honey, and they had so many pancakes, Mrs. Thumpkins asked Billy Bumblebee if he would fly around and invite all the neighbors in to help eat them. Tommy Grasshopper, Grandpa Tobacky Worm, and all the other friends of the Thumpkins came and ate the lovely pancakes covered with the delicious honey and after eating as much as they could everybody caught hold of hands and danced until late in the night for the katydid orchestra was there to furnish the music end of chapter seven chapter eight of friendly fairies this is a lever box recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry, Johnson City, Tennessee. Friendly Fairies by Johnny Gurrell. Chapter 8. The Old Rough Stone and the Gnarled Tree. A great stone lay beneath a gnarled old tree. Years ago, a tiny squirrel had climbed upon the stone to nibble some nuts. But before he had finished, he was startled away. There, thought the stone to himself, as he saw a nut roll to the ground. Now that nut will take root and grow into a tree, and I will have to lie here for ages beneath its branches. I wish the silly squirrel had gone some other place to eat the nuts. When the little nut took root and sent its tiny shoots up into the air, the old rough stone said, There, I knew it, and he disliked the tree from that time on. The old rough stone watched the tiny tree shoot grow and grow until it grew into an enormous tree. Just see how he pushes me into the air with his roots, the old rough stone said to himself. When the gnarled tree was covered with leaves in the summer time, the old rough stone said, Just see how he hides the blue sky from my view. And in the winter, when the leaves of the tree were bare, the old rough stone said, Just see how he lets the snow and the cold rain fall right on me. One night, during a heavy storm, the old rough stone heard a crash, and in the morning he saw the gnarled tree lying on the ground. Now I shall be all by myself again, he said. Then he counted the rings in the trunk of the gnarled tree, until he came to three hundred, which was as far as he could count. More than three hundred years have passed since that silly little squirrel dropped that nut from which this tree grew said the old rough stone to himself. Then men came with axes and cut up the tree and carried all of it away. When the hot summer days came, the sun beat down upon the old rough stone, and he missed the shade of that gnarled tree. My, it's hot, said the old rough stone. I wish that gnarled tree with its pretty rustling leaves were here again to shade me and keep me cool. When winter came, the old rough stone missed the leaves, which fell around him and kept him warm. "'Oh, dear, how cold it is!' he cried. "'I wish the gnarled tree would come back and scatter his leaves about me to protect me from the cold.' So years and years passed, and the great old rough stone lay all alone. I wish another squirrel would come and eat nuts upon me, he thought. Squirrels are such knowing little creatures. I am sure another might drop a nut, which would grow into a lovely tree and keep me company. But many more years passed, and never again did a tiny squirrel sit upon the old rough stone and eat nuts. And never again did another tree grow above the old rough stone to keep him company. Ah, me, sighed the old rough stone. We never know how well off we are until we lose something we really need. 
End of chapter 8 Recording by Larry, Johnson City, Tennessee Chapter 9 of Friendly Fairies This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Danny Wakongler. Friendly Fairies by Johnny Gruley. Chapter 9. Sally McGrundy. Sally McGrundy lived all alone in a tiny little cottage no larger than a piano box. This was plenty large enough for Sally McGrundy, though, for she was a tiny little lady herself. Sally McGrundy's tiny little cottage stood at the edge of a stream, a beautiful crystal clear stream of tinkling water, which sang in a continual murmur all day and all night to Sally McGrundy. The stream tinkled merrily through a great forest, which lay for miles and miles, a green mantle over the hills and valleys, and Sally McGrundy's tiny little cottage stood in the exact center of the great whispering forest. All the wood creatures knew and loved Sally McGrundy, and she knew and loved all of the wood creatures. Each morning she would scatter food upon the surface of the singing stream, and the lovely fish, their sides reflecting rainbow colors, would leap from the tinkling waters and splash about to show their pleasure. And she would place food about her little garden for the birds, and they in turn repaid her with wonderful melodies. Even the mama deer brought their little wobbly-legged baby deer to introduce to Sally McGrundy, and she rubbed their sleek sides and talked to them, so they couldn't but love her. Now Sally McGrundy had always lived in her tiny cottage on the bank of the tickling stream which ran through the whispering forest. She had lived there when the largest trees in the forest were little tiny sprouts. She had lived there long before that, and even still longer than that, and that and that, ever so much longer. One day, a man who lived on a hill many, many miles away from the Whispering Forest said to his wife, Mother, wouldn't you like to know where the water that flows from our spring goes to? And his wife replied, It must travel until it reaches the ocean. Yes, I know that, Mother. He replied, But I mean, wouldn't it be interesting to know all of the country through which the water flows? The more they talked of it, the more interested they became, until the man finally wrote upon a slip of paper and put the paper into a tiny bottle. Then he put the bottle upon the surface of the spring water and watched it float away. The little bottle floated along, tumbling over the tiny falls and tinkling ripples and bobbing up and down in the deep blue quiet places until finally it floated to Sally McGrundy's and came to a rest in the mass of pretty flowers where Sally McGrundy came each morning to dip her tiny bucket of water. And so Sally McGrundy found the tiny bottle and took it into her tiny house to read the tiny note she saw inside. It was such a nice, happy-hearted note. Sally McGrundy said, I will answer it. So she wrote a happy-hearted note and asked whoever read it to come visit her. Then she put her note in the tiny bottle and sent it dancing and bobbing down through the whispering forest, riding upon the surface of the singing stream. And Sally McGrundy's note floated along in the bottle until a little boy and a little girl saw it and picked it up. And when they read Sally McGrundy's happy-hearted note asking them to visit her, they started following up the stream until after a long, long time they came to a tiny little cottage. Sally McGrundy was very much surprised to see the two children, for she had almost forgotten she had written the invitation. How did it do? said Sally McGrundy. Where in the world did you children come from? We found a note in a bottle and traveled up the stream until we came to your little cottage. They answered, 
but won't your mamas and daddies be worried because you have been away from home so long? Sally McGrundy asked. We are orphans, the children said. Then Sally McGrundy kissed them and asked them into her tiny cottage. The door was so small that children had to get down upon their hands and knees to crawl through. But when they got inside, they were surprised to find that the rooms were very large. In fact, Sally McGrundy's living room was larger inside than the whole little cottage was on the outside. For, as you have probably guessed, Sally McGrundy's cottage was a magic house. And in one corner of the living room, there was a queer stand with a silver stem sticking up through the center. And the stem curved over and down towards five or six little crystal glasses. It was a magic soda fountain, as the children soon found out. And they could have all the soda water they wished at any time. In another room, there were two little snow white beds. These belonged to them, Sally McGrundy told the children. As you have probably guessed, the magic cottage took care to make everything comfortable for those who came inside. And when Sally McGrundy had showed the children their pretty bedroom, she took them to the dining room, and there they found a table which had everything nice to eat upon it. And so the children ate and ate and ate, for the magic table knew just what the person wished for who sat at it. So you may be sure that there were plenty of cookies and ice cream and candies and golden donuts and everything. So the two little orphan children lived all the time with Sally McGrundy. And each morning when they tumbled laughing and shouting out of their little snow white beds, they found underneath a new present. And each morning they had a new toy to play with. For the magic beds knew just what the children would like most each day. Sally McGrundy was very, very glad the children had come to live with her. So she wrote more notes and sent them down the singing stream. And more and more children came until Sally McGrundy's house was very, very large inside. But still, the same tiny little cottage on the outside. The singing and happy laughter of the children echoed through the whispering forest all day, and the ground about the cottage was filled with toys and playthings, merry-go-rounds, sliding boards, sand piles, hundreds of sand toys and playhouses filled with beautiful dolls and doll furniture. There was a roller coaster, which knew just when to stop and start so that none of the children could ever hurt themselves upon it, and a little play grocery, a little play candy store, and a little play ice cream parlor, so the children could go there at any time and get cookies and candy and ice cream whenever they wished. You may be sure it was a very happy place to live, and the children made Sally McGrundy very happy. At first, the creatures who lived in the Whispering Forest were very surprised to hear the happy laughter and see so many children playing about. But they soon grew accustomed to the children and came right up to the grocery and candy store and ice cream parlor to be fed. Each year, Sally McGrundy sends happy-hearted invitations floating down the stream and more orphan children come to live with her. However, Sally McGrundy's tiny cottage is just the same tiny cottage on the outside. But... Once you crawl through the tiny door, you look upon rows and rows of little rooms, each having one or more little snow white beds in it. And while Sally McGrundy remains a tiny little old lady only two feet high, she has much happiness inside as if she were large as a great big mountain. For as you have probably also guessed, she is a fairy and can have as much room inside for happiness as the little magic cottage could have room inside for all the happy children. One day, the man who lived upon the hill where the spring bubbles up from the ground and makes the beginning of the singing stream said to his wife, Mother, I will follow the stream and see where it leads to. So he started down the stream and walked and walked and walked until the stream took him down through the whispering forest clear down to the sea. 
Then he turned around and walked back up the stream from the ocean, up through the whispering forest until he came again to his home at the top of the hill. I found the stream down through a great whispering forest, mother, he said, until I came to the sea. Then I turned around and came back the same way. It was a beautiful trip. And when I came to the center of the great whispering forest, there was a clearing at the side of the tinkling singing stream, and the lovely fish leaped from the crystal waters to show me their wonderful coloring. And the clearing was filled with beautiful flowers, and the music of birds. And it was so beautiful, I stopped and watched and listened. It seemed as if hundreds of children were playing around me, and although I could not hear them, yet it seemed to me that I felt they were shouting and laughing at their play. How wonderful it must have been, said his wife. It was indeed very wonderful, mother. And when I returned, I again stopped at the same place and sat and listened to the singing of the waters and the birds. And I saw the wild creatures come down into the clearing and act as if they were being fed. And all the time, I seemed to feel the laughter and happy shouting of children at play. And a most delightful feeling of contentment and happiness came over me, as if I sat within the borders of fairyland. Then, as I stooped to drink of the tinkling waters before I started on my way home, I saw, tied to a flower growing in the water, the tiny little bottle with the note inside, which I had floated off a long time ago. So I brought it home with me. And from his knapsack, the man took the tiny bottle and placed it on the table before his wife. I wish we knew just who tied the bottle to the flower, said the wife as she picked the bottle up to look at it. And because the bottle had been used by Sally McGrundy, the two good people suddenly knew all about Sally McGrundy, the magic little cottage, and the happy children who lived there. Every year, the man takes his wife, and together they walk down the tinkling stream until they come to the exact center of the great whispering forest. There they sit for hours at a time, feeling the happiness that overflows from the hearts of Sally McGrundy and the children. And while the good couple have not been able to see the children, or Sally McGrundy, or even the tiny magic cottage, they know they are all there, for at times they can hear the laughter, and once in a while they feel the touch of a tiny hand, and when they return to their home upon the hill, they find they've received enough happiness at the clearing beside the tinkling singing water to last them for a whole year. End of chapter 9. Recording by Danny Wakongla. Chapter 10 of Friendly Fairies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Friendly Fairies by Johnny Gruel. Chapter 10. How Johnny Cricket Saw Santa Claus When the first frost came and coated the leaves with its film of sparkles, Mama Cricket, Papa Cricket, Johnny Cricket, and Grandpa Cricket decided it was time they moved into their winter home. Papa and Mama and Grandpa Cricket carried all the heavy cricket furniture, while Johnny Cricket carried the lighter things, such as the family portraits, looking glasses, knives and forks and spoons, and his own little violin. Aunt Katie did wheel Johnny's little sister Teeny in the cricket baby buggy and helped Mama Cricket lay the rugs and wash the stonework, for you see the cricket winter home was in the chimney of a big old-fashioned house, and the walls were very dusty and everything was topsy-turvy. But Mama Cricket and Aunt Katie did soon had everything in tip-top order, and the winter home was just as clean and neat as the summer home out under the rose bush had been. There the Cricket family lived happily, and everything was just as cozy as any little bug would care to have. On cold nights, the people who owned the great big old-fashioned house always made a fire in the fireplace, 
so the walls of the cricket's winter home were nice and warm and little teeny cricket could play on the floor in her bare feet without fear of catching cold and getting the cricket croup there was one crack in the walls of the cricket's winter home which opened right into the fireplace so the light from the fire always lit up the cricket's living room papa cricket could read the bugville news while johnny cricket fiddled all the latest popular bug songs and mamma cricket rocked and sang to little teeny cricket one night though the people who owned the great big old-fashioned house did not have a fire in the fireplace and little teeny cricket was bundled up in warm covers and rocked to sleep and all the cricket family went to bed in the dark johnny cricket had just dozed into dreamland when he was awakened by something pounding ever so loudly and he slipped out of bed and into his two little red top boots and felt his way to the crack in the living room wall johnny heard loud voices and merry peals of laughter so he crawled through the crack and looked out into the fireplace there in front of the fireplace he saw four pink feet and two laughing faces way above while just a couple of cricket hops from johnny's nose was a great big man johnny could not see what the man was pounding but he made an awful loud noise finally the pounding ceased and the man leaned over and kissed the owners of the pink feet then there were a few more squeals of laughter and the four pink feet pitter-patted across the floor and johnny could see the owners hop into a snow-white bed then johnny saw the man walk to the lamp and turn the light down low and leave the great big room johnny cricket jumped out of the crack into the fireplace and ran out into the great big room so that he might see what the man had pounded the light from the lamp was too dim for him to make out the objects hanging from the mantle above the fireplace all he could see were four long black things so johnny cricket climbed up the bricks at the side of the fireplace until he came to the mantel shelf then he ran along the shelf and looked over the black things were stockings johnny began to wish that he had stopped to put on his stockings for he was in his bare feet he had removed his little red-topped boots when he decided to climb up the side of the fireplace and now his feet were cold so johnny started to climb over the mantel shelf and down the side of the fireplace when there came a puff of wind down the chimney which made the stockings swing away out into the room and snowflakes fluttered clear across the room there was a tiny tinkle from a bell and just as johnny hopped behind the clock he saw a boot stick out of the fireplace then johnny cricket's little bug heart went pity pat and sounded as if it would run a race with the ticking of the clock from his hiding place johnny cricket heard one or two chuckles and something rattle johnny crept along the edge of the clock and holding the two feelers over his back looked from his hiding place at first all he could see were two hands filling the stockings with rattly things but when the hands went down below the mantel for more rattly things johnny cricket saw a big round smiling face all fringed with snow-white whiskers johnny drew back into the shadow of the clock and stayed there until the rattling had ceased and all had grown quiet then he slipped from behind the clock and climbed down the side of the fireplace as fast as he could johnny cricket was too cold to stop and put on his little red boots but scrambled through the crack in the fireplace and hopped into bed in the morning mamma cricket had a hard time getting johnny cricket out of bed he yawned and stretched put on one stocking rubbed his eyes yawned put on another stocking and yawned again johnny was still very sleepy and could hardly keep his eyes open as he reached for his little red top boots johnny's toe struck something hard he yawned rubbed his eyes and looked into the boot yes there was something in johnny cricket's boot he picked up the other boot it too had something in it it was candy with a loud cry for such a little cricket johnny rushed to the kitchen and showed mamma then he told her of his adventure of the night before mamma cricket called papa and they both had a laugh when johnny told how startled he had been at the old man with the white whiskers who filled the stockings in front of the fireplace why johnny said mamma and papa cricket don't you know that was santa claus 
we have watched him every christmas of the last four years fill the stockings and he saw your little red top boots and filled them with candy too if you will crawl through the crack into the fireplace you will see the children of the people who own this big house playing with all the presents that santa claus left them and sure enough it was so end of chapter ten chapter eleven of friendly fairies this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen friendly fairies by johnny gruel chapter eleven the twin sisters everybody in the little village called them the twin houses because they were built exactly alike but the two little cottages looked different even if they were built alike for one was covered with climbing vines and beautiful scarlet roses while the other had no vines or flowers about it at all everybody called the two cottages the twin houses for another reason the owners were twins one of the twins was matilda and the other katrinka and they were as much alike on the outside as their two cottages were alike but as their two cottages differed so did the two twins differ matilda could not be told from katrinka should you just see them walking down the street but the minute either of them spoke you would know which was matilda and which was katrinka matilda who lived in the bare cottage was sour and disagreeable while katrinka was happy and cheery so the people in the little village called matilda matilda grouch and they called katrinka katrinka sunshine all the children of the little village loved katrinka for she always had a cookie or a dainty in her apron pocket to give them or she would pat them on their curly heads and smile cheerily at them through her glasses and all the children avoided matilda for sometimes mistaking her for katrinka and running close to greet her they would have their noses tweaked for their trouble matilda's life was lonely and cold no one went to see her she was always unhappy katrinka's house always echoed with the laughter of children every one went to see her she was always joyful and cheery one night while matilda sat at her dark window looking across at katrinka's house she saw a crowd of people tiptoeing up to the stoop with baskets under their arms and flowers in their hands and when all had crowded upon the porch they stamped their feet and made a great noise matilda was very angry but katrinka ran laughing to the door and greeted all with her kindliest smile it was a surprise party for katrinka for it was her birthday matilda watched the party from her dark window and the longer she watched the more angry she grew for the longer the party lasted the louder grew the happy laughter finally when all the guests had gone matilda saw katrinka gather up half of the presents and put them in a basket then katrinka stole softly up to matilda's stoop and stamped her feet matilda sat scowling by the dark window a long time before she finally went to the door for she was very peevish this is a fine time to come stamping upon a person's stoop she scolded as katrinka walked into the living-room oh sister katrinka cried as she tried to kiss matilda this is our birthday and i have brought you half of the presents which were given me see and she piled the presents high upon the table i do not wish them said matilda frowning at her sister but katrinka could see that matilda did wish them the presents were not for me katrinka she said oh yes they are katrinka replied they were given to me and i give them to you i have saved one half for myself but you should have been to the party said katrinka we had such a happy time i do not enjoy being with people matilda scolded i wish to be left to myself yes but matilda her sister said you do not know the happiness in being kind and friendly to others pooh sniffed matilda i just wish you could take my place and know the happiness that is in my heart to-night 
katrinka smiled i just wish you could take my place and know the unhappiness that is in my heart to-night said matilda you would see that a lot of children screeching about the house with all their presence could not bring me happiness katrinka thought a moment i have it matilda we will change places you must live in my house and pretend that you are me and i will live in your house and pretend that i am you and you must smile and be friendly just as i would do after a great deal of coaxing matilda finally agreed that she would change places with katrinka and try to smile when any one came to see her but only for three days she said so matilda went over to katrinka's cottage and went to bed and katrinka stayed in matilda's cottage but she did not go to bed instead she went all over the house and tidied everything up and placed pretty white curtains at the windows in the morning neighbors came to katrinka's house and matilda taking katrinka's place met them with a smile and soon in spite of herself she was laughing and enjoying herself and when they left matilda felt that she enjoyed having them there but what was the caller's surprise when they passed matilda's cottage to see some one planting flowers around the stoop they stopped in wonderment and as katrinka looked up at them with a cheery good morning and a happy smile they could scarce believe their eyes and ears for they thought it was matilda and these callers told other neighbors and they called at katrinka's house and visited with matilda and matilda was so pleased she laughed as cheerily as katrinka could laugh and as the neighbors left they saw katrinka in matilda's front yard planting flowers and stopped in open-mouthed wonder to gaze at her for they thought she was matilda and when katrinka smiled at them and said her cheery good morning they could scarcely believe their eyes and ears the neighbors all put their heads together and that evening they filled their baskets with goodies and presents and with large bouquets of flowers they tiptoed up to matilda's front stoop and stamped their feet now katrinka had called matilda over to her own house to see the changes she had made and matilda was beginning to see what she had missed all along and as they were talking there came a noise at the front stoop shall i go to the door matilda asked katrinka no i will go katrinka matilda replied her face alight with happiness so matilda welcomed her guests as cheerily as katrinka had done the evening before and the laughter lasted until way in the night and when the last guest had left matilda took katrinka in her arms and said i will not need to change places with you again katrinka for i have found that there is far more pleasure in being happy than in being unhappy of course there is matilda katrinka replied you see in order to be happy ourselves we must reflect happiness to others and the more cheer we give to others the more joy we receive ourselves so we must continue to change from one house to another every other day so that no one will know which of us is matilda and which is katrinka and we will share our happiness with each other so matilda's house was soon surrounded with beautiful flowers and her house echoed with the fun and laughter of happy children end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of friendly fairies this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Friendly Fairies by Johnny Gruel Chapter 12 Little Thumpkin's Good Deed Thumpkins lived in a tiny, cozy little house right down beneath a mushroom. The tiny little house was made of cobwebs which Thumpkins had gathered from the bushes and weeds. These he had woven together with thistledown, making the nicest little nest imaginable one day thumpkins was passing through the meadow and it began to rain dear me i shall get soaking wet thumpkins cried as he hurried along a mamma meadowlark sitting upon her nest saw thumpkins running and called to him come here little man and get beneath my wing and i will keep you warm and dry so thumpkins crawled beneath mamma meadowlark's wings and snuggling down close to the bottom of the meadowlark's nest he found three tiny little baby meadowlarks 
It was too dark for Thumpkins to see them, but he felt that the baby meadowlarks were as warm as toast. Thumpkins kept very quiet, for the baby meadowlarks were sleepy little fellows, and before he knew it, Thumpkins was sound asleep himself, with an arm around one of the baby birds. Thumpkins did not know how long he had been asleep, but when he awakened, the rain had ceased. Thumpkins knew it had stopped raining, for he could no longer hear the raindrops pattering upon Mama Meadowlark's back. So now he climbed out of the nest and looked about. The ground about the Meadowlark's nest was covered with tiny puddles, and Mama Meadowlark was soaking wet. She looked very uncomfortable. Her feathers stuck out in all directions, and a drop of water fell from her head and rolled down her beak. Thumpkins thought at first Mama Meadowlark was crying, and he said, Are you cold, Mama Meadowlark? Yes, indeed, Mama Meadowlark replied as she shook her ruffled feathers, sending the water flying in all directions. But you see, she continued, if I did not cover my baby Meadowlark chicks, they would get very, very cold, for they have little bald heads with not a single feather upon them to protect them. So while I get wet, it does not matter so much, for I know I have kept my little Meadowlark chicks dry and warm and cozy, and that, of course, makes me very happy. And I had the pleasure of keeping you warm and dry, too, Mama Meadowlark added. Perhaps Mama Meadowlark is very happy inside, Thumpkins thought to himself as he stood and looked at her. But she does not look very happy with such wet feathers. I thank you ever and ever so much, Mama Meadowlark, Thumpkins said. You are indeed very welcome, Mama Meadowlark replied. And any time it rains, you can come back to my nest and crawl beneath my wing and keep warm and dry. For you are tiny and do not take up much room. Thumpkins thanked Mama Meadowlark again and told her of his nice, warm, cozy little nest beneath the mushroom. It is always nice and dry there, he said, for the rain runs right off the mushroom and does not touch my little cobweb home. That night, as he lay in his little thistle-down bed, Thumpkins heard it thundering. I'm very glad that I haven't a home built right out upon the bare ground like the meadowlarks, he said, and as the thunder grew louder, Thumpkins turned over and tried to go to sleep. Presently, the raindrops began to patter on the round top of the mushroom and drip-dropped to the ground without getting Thumpkins' little house the least bit wet. Usually when it rained, the patter of the raindrops upon his mushroom roof lulled Thumpkins right to sleep. But tonight, Thumpkins lay wide awake and thought and thought. I can't go to sleep, Thumpkins said, so he hopped out of his warm little bed and lit his tiny lantern. Then, though it was raining ever so hard, he pulled his little hat well down on his head and ran out into the storm. Yes, there was Mama Meadowlark sitting upon her nest with her head tucked under her wings sound asleep. But when he held his tiny lantern close, Thumpkins could see that she shivered as the cold raindrops splashed upon her back. So Thumpkins ran to the woods where he knew the mushrooms grew, and breaking off the largest one he could find, he carried it to where Mama Meadowlark sat sleeping upon her nest, and planted it so the raindrops rolled right off the round roof and did not touch her at all. Then, shivering himself, for he was soaking wet, he ran home as fast as he could, took off his dripping clothes, put on his little pajamas, and climbed into his warm little cozy cobweb bed. Now, of course, Thumpkins was happy, because he had helped another, and when a person is happy, there's nothing to worry about, and when there's nothing to worry about, of course, there is nothing to keep one awake. So Thumpkins fell fast asleep and dreamed the most pleasant dreams. And they were such happy dreams, Thumpkins slept until almost half past eight the next morning. End of chapter 12. Chapter 13 of Friendly Fairies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Danny Wakongler. The Wishbone The stove lifter lay upon his iron side and looked across the top of the shelf which stood above the stove. Who is he? He asked the box of matches lying near him. The box of matches 
looked at the strange new object standing upon two thin white legs and leaning against the wall near the coffee pot. I do not know, the matchbox answered. Then they asked a number of other objects lying about if they knew who the newcomer was, but none of them had ever seen anything like him before. When the new two-legged object with the bald head heard everyone whispering, he felt they were talking about him, and he stepped out where all might see him and walked up and down the shelf at the back of the stove. The stove lifter, the matchbox, and all the other objects watched him with interest as he strutted back and forth. At last, the new object stood still, and with his head thrown back, he said, I am the wishbone. But as none of you know what the wishbone is, I shall tell you. A wishbone is an object of great importance in this world. Some of us come from the breasts of chickens, and some from the breasts of turkeys. When we are placed above a door sill in a house, we bring good luck. Don't the people in the house here wish good luck? Asked the matchbox. What a silly question, replied the wishbone. Anyone could easily see you do not know much. Then why didn't they place you above the door? Asked the stove lifter. Because I have greater qualities than bringing good luck, the wishbone answered. The children placed me here to dry, for they have heard that I make wishes come true. And if you keep your eyes and ears open, you will see just what a great object a wishbone really is. All the other objects upon the shelf on the back of the stove held their breaths to think such an important object deigned to talk to them. Then the children came romping into the kitchen. Here they come, cried the wishbone. Now watch me make their wishes come true. And all the other objects scarcely breathed while they watched the children as they took the wishbone from the shelf. They could see how proud he looked as the children each took one of the wishbone's legs between their fingers. I wish that this kitchen were just filled with candy and cake and we could eat all we wish to, one of the children said. And I wish for a million golden pennies piled high upon the kitchen table, the other child cried. Now watch. The wishbone winked to the other objects upon the shelf behind the stove. The two children pulled upon the wishbone's legs. Ouch! He cried. There was a loud snap, and the wishbone broke into two. I get my wish! Cried the child with the longest part of the broken wishbone. The room will be filled with candy. Watch the room fill with, with candy! candy cried all the objects upon the shelf. How wonderful it must be to be a wishbone. But the room did not fill with candy. That's another time the wish did not come true, cried one child. They never come true, cried the other child as the broken wishbone was tossed in the coal scuttle. Wishbones are just ordinary bones and do not make wishes come true. And the children ran outside to romp and play. How much better it is to be a useful object, said the stove lifter. Yes, indeed, replied the matchbox. And the more useful one is, usually the less he brags about himself. End of chapter 13. Recording by Danny Wakongla. Chapter 14 of Friendly Fairies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Molly Lynn, San Francisco, California. Friendly Fairies by Johnny Gruel. Chapter 14. 
Tim Tim Tammy Tam. This looks like an excellent place, Tim Tim, Mrs. Tammy Tam said as she threw her little poke bonnet back from her head. An excellent place. Tim Tim Tammy Tam scrambled up the root of the tree and peered into the dark hole in the tree trunk. Hmm, he said by way of reply. Did you bring the candle with you, Tum Tum? Oh, I forgot it, Tim Tim, his little wife replied. I will run right back and get it. No, Tum Tum, I will run home and get it. You sit down upon this soft little toadstool and wait until I return. It will take me but a moment. So Mrs. Tammy Tam sat down to wait upon the little soft toadstool with her bonnet hanging over her shoulders, and she sang and knitted. Now, Mrs. Tammy Tam was a delightful little elfish lady, and she and Tim Tim were very, very happy together, even though they were only six inches tall. So, while she sang and knitted, Tim Tim ran down the tiny path made by the wood folk, past the bubbling spring and around the bend in the bank of the tumbling brooklet, until he came to his home, which was another hole in the trunk of an old tree. As Tim Tim climbed into his doorway, he stood and looked with dismay at what had been his cozy living room, for now it was filled with sawdust and small pieces of sticks and twigs, for the whole top of the old tree had broken off, and now the rain would splash right down on everything the first time there was a shower. Tim Tim Tammy Tam searched about in the sawdust and twigs until he found a tiny bit of bayberry candle, and, putting this in his pocket, he turned to go out of the hole. But just then, Tom Tom Teeny Weeny walked in the door. Hello, Tom Tom Teeny Weeny, Tim Tim cried cheerily. Hello, Tim Tim Tammy Tam, Tom Tom cried at the same time. Whatever has happened to your lovely home, Tim Tim? Well, I will tell you, Tom Tom, Tim Tim answered. You know, Mrs. Fuzzytail lived with her grandchildren squirrels up in the top of the tree, and they had a very cozy den up there, too. But Mrs. Fuzzytail wished to make some small improvements, such as a new peephole window and a little cupboard for chinkapins and hickory nuts. So last summer she sent for the carpenter ants and arranged with them to do the carpenter work. And do you know Tom Tom? And here, Tim Tim Tammy Tam put his hand upon Tom Tom's shoulder and got very confidential. Those mischievous carpenter ants, when once they got started, they sawed and chipped until they had cut almost all of the shell of the tree away. And when it blew so very hard last night, the top of the tree broke right in two, where the ants had made their tunnels. And down it fell with a great crash and made this great pile of sawdust and sticks. Dear me, said Tom Tom, was anyone hurt when the top of the tree fell? Fortunately, no one was injured, Tim Tim replied. But our home was ruined, and so was Mrs. Fuzzytail's and Wally Woodpecker's. The bachelor and we have been out looking for another home. If you will come with me, Tom Tom, I will show it to you, for now I have a candle and can look about inside. So Tim Tim and Tom Tom ran back along the tiny wood folk path until they came to the place where Tim Tim had left Mrs. Tammy Tam. There hung her knitting bag upon the stem of a flower, but Tum Tum Tammy Tam was nowhere about. Ahoo! Tim Tim called, putting his hands to his mouth and forming a sort of horn. Charlie Chipmunk stopped whittling upon a hickory nut and peeped over the limb to see who called. Mrs. Tammy Tam did not answer, so Tom Tom took a leaf and rolled it into a horn. Across the small end he strung a string of fiber from a piece of moss, and with this elven horn he blew the Tim Tim Tammy Tam wood call. To who, to who, to who, who, who. That's the Tim Tim Tammy Tam call, all the wood creatures said as they listened. To who, to who, to who, who, who. And as Tim Tim and Tom Tom listened, they heard away off the answering Tammy Tam wood call. To woo, to woo, to a woo, sounding like the plaintive notes of the turtle dove, but was easily distinguished by any of the wood folk. Tim Tim and Tom Tom followed the sound of the answering call until they came to a beautiful woodland glade, there where the sweet ferns and fragrant flowers grew in profusion, and a carpet of velvety moss spread upon the ground, they saw Mrs. Tom Tom Teeny Weeny and Mrs. Tim Tim Tammy Tam with tiny brooms sweeping out a little hole in a great blue-gray beech tree. I came upon Mrs. Tammy Tam sitting upon the toadstool, said Mrs. Teeny Weeny, and as I had just heard of this lovely home for rent, she came with me to see it and we decided to take it. And will Tom Tom and Mrs. Teeny Weeny live with us, Tom Tom? Tim Tim asked. They have the little nook right across the hall, Mrs. Tammy Tam replied. 
Upon hearing this, Tom Tom and Tim Tim caught hold of hands and danced about, kicking up their heels with pleasure. Just wait until you see inside Tom Tom and Tim Tim, Mrs. Teeny Weeny and Mrs. Tammy Tam cried, and then they led the way inside the trunk of the great blue-gray beech tree. And after they had inspected Mrs. Tammy Tam's home, Mrs. Teeny Weenie's Tom Tom and Tim Tim were as delighted with the new homes as their tiny wives had been. So Tim Tim and Tom Tom ran to their old homes and brought all their furniture and placed it about the large living rooms. When all was finished and the tiny rugs had been placed just right, they heard a stamping of tiny feet in the hallway. And as they ran to the door, a merry laughing crowd of tiny creatures like themselves, each carrying an acorn basket, trooped into the living room. It's a surprise party, they all shouted, and then one, T.T. Tubbytree, a great speaker, said, We watched you moving in and decided to have a nice, fine, lovely party for you, so I called all the neighbors together and here we are. Some of the tiny creatures had brought their tiny violins and some their elfin flutes, and as all were in a merry mood, they played rollicking airs such as The Wind Tinkles the Fairy Bells and Mother Holda Picks Her Geese. Tim Tim and Tom Tom danced and sang elfin songs, and then the merry tiny creatures ate the goodies brought in the acorn baskets. After the dinner, all the tiny creatures went outside, and upon the soft mossy carpet they held a wood folk dance while the silvery moon peeped down through the leaves of a woodland glade and bathed the scene in a fairy light. When the first rooster crowed far away in a distant farmyard chicken coop, the tiny creatures, after planning another surprise party the next moonlit night, bade each other good night and went to their tree trunk homes. So upon soft summer evenings, should you pass near the woodland glade, you may hear the to who, to who, to who, 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 and the answering notes of the plaintive melody, to woo, to woo, to a woo, for the tiny creatures have adopted the Tammy Tam call as the call to the evening parties and you must step quietly and approach softly so as not to disturb the tiny creatures when you wish to see one of their moonlight surprise parties. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Friendly Fairies This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Friendly Fairies by Johnny Gruel Chapter 15 A Change of Coats Two mischievous little gnomes were walking along the beach one day, and as they came to a pile of rocks they heard voices. One of the little gnomes put his finger to his lips for silence and peeped cautiously around the largest stone. There he saw a crab and a lobster sitting upon a bunch of seaweed in the sunshine. The other little gnome tiptoed up and joined his brother, and when they had listened a while they winked at each other and quietly walked back to the beach. After whispering together a moment, one of the little gnomes ran up the beach and over a sand dune. The other gnome again crept up behind the large stone and listened to the lobster and the crab. "'Yes,' said the crab, "'I agree with you, Mr. Lobster. "'While our coats are just a plain green, "'they are still quite beautiful.' "'Ah, you speak the truth, friend crab,' the lobster said. "'Green is a lovely color, "'and I am very glad that we are not purple.' "'I am very glad that we are green, too,' the crab said. "'Just suppose we were colored blue. "'I know I should not be able to stand it. "'Would you, friend lobster?' "'No, indeed,' the lobster cried. "'Nor would I care to change to any other color. "'Would you, friend crab?' "'It is nice to be satisfied, isn't it, friend lobster?' "'Yes, especially when we are as satisfied as we are,' the lobster answered. "'The little gnome, listening behind the large stone, "'winked at himself and smiled. "'He knew the lobster and the crab would give anything "'if they were of a different color, "'for he could tell by their conversation "'that they were dissatisfied with their green coats.' Soon the other little gnome appeared over the sand dunes, carrying a large kettle, and when he got to a spot on the beach where the crab and the lobster could see and hear him, he began shouting in a sing-song manner, "'Old clothes changed to new! Old clothes changed to new! Old clothes changed to new!' "'Pooh!' said the lobster, who was foolish enough to wish to change their natural coats. 
Hmm, said the crab, as he sidled towards the beach. Let's go over and talk with him anyway, and ask him if anyone ever changes the color of their clothes. Not that I wish to change my lovely green coat, you understand, but— It would be interesting to hear about it anyway, the lobster replied, as he crawled after the crab. The little gnome with the large kettle sat upon the beach and pretended he did not see the crab and lobster, but continued crying, Old coats changed to new, old coats changed to new, old coats changed to new, old coats changed to new. When the crab and lobster came up quite near, the little gnome pulled a number of pieces of colored cloth from his pocket and placed them upon the sand. How pretty, said the crab. Very lovely, said the lobster. Do you wish your coats changed in color? asked the little gnome. Ah, no thank you, the two hypocrites said. We were just looking around a bit. Well, I am glad to have your company, said the little gnome, as he took a piece of scarlet cloth and laid it over the lobster's back. How do you like that? he asked of the crab. It looks fine, said the crab. Try it on me. The little gnome placed the scarlet piece of cloth over the crab's back. How do you like it? he asked the lobster. Did I look that well in that color? asked the lobster by way of reply. I think both of you will look far better if you let me change you to scarlet. It's in far better taste, too, the little gnome added, pinching himself to keep from laughing. Shall we change? the crab asked the lobster, and the lobster asked the crab. You will find the color a great deal warmer, said the little gnome. Green is decidedly cold, you know. So the little gnome gathered an armful of driftwood and built a fire. Then he dipped the kettle into the sea, and placed the crab and the lobster in the kettle of water, and put the lid on. "'Be sure and make us a brilliant scarlet!' cried the lobster and the crab, as the little gnome placed the kettle over the fire. An hour later the two little gnomes lay upon their backs upon the sand and yawned contentedly, their little round stomachs almost bursting their belts. Near them was the upturned kettle, and scattered all about them on the sand were lovely pieces of scarlet lobster and crab shells. It's funny, one little gnome said drowsily, how one sometimes will become dissatisfied with the way he was made by Mother Nature, and try to improve upon her work. It usually leads to misfortune. Yes, that is true, the other little gnome replied. We should be satisfied and contented just as we are. Well, I for one am satisfied, the little gnome said, stroking his fat stomach. So am I, his brother laughed. End of chapter 15 End of Friendly Fairies by Johnny Gruel.